Good morning, Chappelle, and happy Sunday to all of you. This week, I was just sitting in my home in the spirit of praise, and I had the lyrics to one of our familiar songs ringing in my head, saying that it could have been me outdoors with no food and no clothes, or just alone without a friend, or just another number with a tragic end. But the Lord didn't see fit to let none of these things be. Every day and every hour, the Lord just keeps on and he just keeps on and he just keeps on blessing me. And I just wanna say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for me. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Father God. Lord, we thank you for keeping us, Father God. Lord, we thank you for loving on us, Father God. Lord, we thank you for healing us, Lord God. We thank you for being a faithful God. We thank you for being an awesome God. We thank you for being a just God, Lord God. We thank you for being the miracle worker, Lord God. We thank you for being a promise keeper, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for ruling and reigning over our lives, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for your hedge of protection around us, Lord God. We thank you for keeping us, Lord God, from getting the coronavirus, Lord God. We thank you for keeping us in our right mind, Father God. So, Lord, we just want to take an opportunity, Father God, to stop in the midst of it all and say thank you, Father God. We will forever give your name all the praise, the glory, and the honor that is due you. Holy Spirit, have your way in our homes. Have your way in this sanctuary. Move like never before. During the sermon, Father God, move like never before. Don't, with our ministers, Father God, move like never before. Through our soloists, move like never before. Through our engineer, Father God, move like never before. Lord, we love you. We praise you and we honor you. And it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, welcome, Chappelle. We bring you greetings from 110 Bradford Drive. We give praise and thanks for our pastor, Reverend Norman E. Carey and his family, and for Dr. Moss for leading us during this time. We also would like to give a special thanks for Dr. Cooper and Ms. Perley for also leading us and keeping us through our communication efforts throughout this time. We ask church family that you stay abreast on the emails that are forthcoming from Dr. Cooper and Mrs. Perley throughout the week. We thank you for for tuning in week after week via Bible study, via prayer with the pastor, via prayer with our Gap ministry. We're so thankful to have many platforms for God to be able to meet you in the confines of your home. At this time, we ask that you prepare your hearts and minds for worship and for a word from the Lord. If you have your Bibles, we ask that you turn with us to Luke Isaiah chapter 43, and I'll be reading verses 14 through 17. I'll be reading from the NIV version. Again, that's Isaiah chapter 43, verses 14 through 17. And it reads, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your King. This is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. I've just read Isaiah 43, verses 14 through 17. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Happy Sunday, Chappelle. Happy Sunday. It's a lot going on in the world today, but another day that the Lord has kept us. Aren't you glad about it? Aren't you glad about it? How many know that God said he will take care of us? I believe that this morning, God will truly take care of his people. If you don't mind, just join up with us as we sing this morning.
not dismayed. Come on and praise him. He's worthy to be praised. 
praise. He will, he will, he will, he will. No matter what you're going through, God will. Yes, he will. The pandemic don't have nothing on Jesus. He will, he will. I feel my help coming on y'all, honey. He Chappelle and certainly we thank God for the opportunity to again reach you by way of this technology. We want to thank each and every person here. I want to thank our sister for that tremendous, that tremendous song that has stirred my heart and I know it stirred yours where you sit. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Eternal God and Savior, we come before you right now, thanking you for mercy, thanking you for grace, and thanking you for favor. Thanking you, Lord, for yet another opportunity to get it right. We thank you, Lord, for this journey during the course of this week. And regardless of what we've been going through, we know that we didn't have to do it alone because you hold us by the power of your hand. Lord, we've heard your word read in our hearing, and we've been blessed with the tremendous song of Zion, and now we need to hear a word from heaven. Send a word, Lord, as only you can, and help us to be mindful, Heavenly Father, that it is your word that changes things. I have studied and I've prepared, but I recognize, Lord, I am but an empty vessel, and I cannot do it on my own. Please fill my cup, Lord, and whatever you put in it, I will share with your people. And then preacher and people can see you revealed together. These things we ask in the marvelous, magnificent name of Jesus Christ. Let every heart say amen. Amen and amen. I want to give a special greeting this morning to our pastor, Dr. Carey, and his family and to this entire church family of Chappelle and those of you who are joining us from around the country by way of this technology. I want to remind you also again uh, to, you'll see it rolling on your screen, let's remember that we have a responsibility as disciples of this congregation to make sure that the needs are met. We want to be able to help those who are most vulnerable and uh, we're going to trust that you will do the right thing because we know that the Lord is doing the right thing by you, even in these challenging times. Amen, amen, amen. I want to share with you this morning from text that was read in our hearing, and I want to pick up from where Minister Stewart left off. I'm going to thank her and Marcus and Gerard this morning for their presence and for all they do to make this worship possible. Um, Isaiah 43, and I want to pick up with the 18th and the 19th verse. You should find the following words. Forget the formal things. Don't dwell on the past. For see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and in the streams of the wasteland. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Reading is one thing and hearing is another, but application is most important. Uh, this morning, I want to share with us uh, for the next brief moment from the theme, business as usual. Business as usual. Um, and I also want to say we're... We're not required to hit a home run all the time, but we are required to wrestle with a great text. And this is a great text. 
Amen. Business as usual. I never thought that in all of my days that I would see the likes of a plague or a pandemic uh, that we're facing in this day and time. And I'm sure that many of you have and know people, you have family and friends and colleagues who as we speak are struggling right now, having a tremendous time. We are, we are struggling with the idea of our freedom uh, being taken away because we are, we like to move. We like to move at will. We like to go and come as we please. And because of the stay at home order, many of us are being challenged. And, and I understand it. I really do. I understand how many of us are bored to tears. And then there are other of us who are nervous as we can be. And I guess it begs the question, how much noise can one person stand from all the rambunctious children that you have in your house and running up and down the stairs and all through the quarters of your home? And boy, because how many books and magazines can one person read? And uh, how much television can you watch? How many series can you absorb? And then how many beatdowns can you take from those merciless masters of PlayStation and Xbox. And this is the best one of all. How many more honey do lists can one stand? Well, I, I stopped by to tell you this morning that I know, and in talking with some friends of mine, I know that there are many of us who want to go back. We want to go back as far as February 2020. We want to go back to work. Let, let me just go back to work and do those 14 to 16 hour work days. Let me, let me go back to do those 60 hour work weeks. If I, could just, if I could just get back into my old routine at work, I promise you, I would volunteer for overtime and I wouldn't even worry about getting paid time and a half. Just, just let me get back to my routine. Let me go back to work. Let me go back to the classroom. Let me go back to the church house. In other words, let me get back involved with business as usual. Now, business as usual really is defined as um, the state of affairs, the understanding the state of affairs that uh, allows us to understand that we're being disturbed and difficult. It's a state of affairs of being disturbed and dis difficult that happens and occurs over and over again. And, and when I read that definition and when I thought about how we would like to go back to business as usual, it, it made me think about the definition, for some reason, of insanity. Wrongly attributed to Albert Einstein, it was really quoted by a woman um, who was attending an Al-Anon meeting, which is the companion group to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, they support families of people who are alcoholics. And they too, like Alcoholics Anonymous, have the 12-step program. But in their second step, it says something about being restored to sanity. And this one lady talked about the idea that she didn't totally agree with that because she had not been on the brink of insanity. So therefore, she defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So when I thought about that definition and when I thought about business as usual, it made me think about the church and how the church, church folk love routine. We love business as usual. We're going to have our anniversary days. We're going to have usher's anniversary. We're going to have church anniversary. We're going to have pastor's anniversary. We're going to have homecoming. And we're going to have every other celebration that you can think of. We love our routine. We want to start with praise and worship. And we want to end with the benediction. And heaven forbid if anything changes in between. We love routine. We love business as usual. But it also reminded me, and I guess you say, this man's got a lot on his mind. Yeah, I got a lot of time on my hands, so I've been doing a lot of thinking. I, I thought back to the year 2000, when I had the privilege of doing a revival in Roanoke, Virginia. And there, while doing revival, it was right after the presidential election of 2000. 
uh, when Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore, and his challenger, George W. Bush, were buying for the presidency. Uh, it was a bare, uh, it was a nail-biting election, I'm sure you would agree. And, and there was a lot of drama, a lot of chaos and confusion centered around that election. And it was undergirded by voter suppression. Uh, but while in Roanoke, I had the opportunity to do some work for the church while I was, to my own church while I was there. And, and then it was time for me to go home. So as I was driving home, I thought about the election. I thought about all this dragging out. And in fact, the election was not decided until January of 2001 by the Supreme Court, who declared that George W. Bush was the winner. So that didn't set too well with me, and as I was riding along, I thought about it, and I had an epiphany. You know, the chaos and the confusion of that election. And then I was thinking about our up-and-coming black history program, which was just a couple of months away. And, and the Lord gave me an epiphany. And, and, and as I thought about it, I, I thought about the uh, report that I had seen from our committee about black history, and what they wanted to do was essentially the usual. Uh, the usual requisites of recitations and uh, historical reports and music about the usual suspects like Martin Luther King Jr. and Frederick Douglass and George Washington, uh, George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner True. Uh, it, it was the same old thing. And to be quite honest, uh, if I were to be honest this morning, I, I was not really excited about the prospect of doing the same old kind of black history program that we do over and over again, year after year, time after time. To me, it really spelled, the, uh, it really represented the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Y'all ought to come on and walk with me. And, and so there, um, this, 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 this whole epiphany that I really believe the Lord gave me was centered around this election and the confusion as it related to the voter suppression, but it also was coupled with this thing about doing another usual black history program. So the Lord fed my mind with an idea on how to do it differently a new and different and unusual way to do our black history program. My, my mind floated thinking about all this confusion and chaos about the election. My mind went to the idea that during the time of the civil rights movement, there were a lot of people who were still in the dark and uninformed or underinformed about the elements of the movement. There were a lot of churches that embraced the movement and supported the movement. But then there were some other churches that did not. And sad to say, there were some pastors in some of our black churches who did not support the movement. They were apathetic. Some of them were afraid. They were fearful. Uh, they were indifferent, and they really didn't care. They really didn't particularly care about Dr. King. They didn't particularly care about the movement. They didn't particularly care about the March on Washington. Uh, they didn't particularly care about anything. So I'm beginning to wonder, how did people then get the word about the movement? Well, I know the NAACP was active and uh, SCLC and SNCC, and they organized in a great way. But then there were churches uh, that did not uh, purport the word and did not support. And then there was a whole nother group of people out there who didn't go to church anywhere, who were not a part of NAACP, not a part of SNCC, not a part of SCLC. How did they get the word about the civil rights? So then it, it came to my mind that perhaps, Marcus, they got it through the music of our time. Y'all ought to come on and walk with me. And, and I truly believe that it was by divine revelation that the Lord placed it in my mind and my heart and I developed a worship that was centered around old school music. Yeah, I know it sounds sacrilegious, but it was centered around old school music. Uh, using the music of entertainers like The Temptations and Marvin Gaye and the Supremes and Stevie Wonder and my favorite, Earth, Wind & Fire. We used their music and took the lyrics and developed helped ourselves to understand and we were better able to understand 
the messages that were contained in those lyrics at the time. Now, don't get me wrong. I understood the makeup and mindset of my congregation. I knew a lot of them wouldn't like it. I understood and embraced the idea that it would be risky. And let me put a pin here, being a pastor is risky business. I, I understood that there would be some obstacles. I understood that there would be some resistance. But I also understood that if I was able to pull it off, then in St. Paul, at least, in black history celebration, it would not be business as usual. I wish I had somebody walking with me. Come on, and let's go back to the text. And there in this text, first thing I want to pull out of here is that God had to remind them. God reminded his people that he uh, delivered them and brought them up out of bondage. You can hear his words that were read earlier uh, in our hearing. He said, for your sake, I took down the Babylonians and the Chaldeans. For your sake, I made a way in the sea. It was for your sake that I put a path in the mighty rivers. For your sake, I made the chariots and the horses and the armies of Egypt lie down beneath the water and extinguish them like a wick in a candle. And all of that was for your sake. Come on and walk with me and understand that the Hebrew slaves had been in captivity for more than 400 years. And it don't take a rocket science to understand that they were assimilated into Egyptian culture. They had grown accustomed to the realities of their, uh, what was now a permanent predicament. And, and then I would even venture to say that they had become acquainted with misery and suffering, the bite of the lash, the sting of the tongue, the severe and sadistic punishments, and even uh, the harsh living conditions and the hard labor conditions uh, had become their identity and the way they had lived their life, and it became the existence of their life. And, and I stop by to tell you, you think about it. Uh, they prayed. Initially, they prayed and they petitioned their God to rescue them and to bring relief and to bring liberation. But somewhere along the line, it appeared that the words did not quite reach the ears of their God. It, it appeared maybe that God had turned a deaf ear toward them. Y'all ought to come on and walk with me. It, it, it sounded like the, the voice of God was eerily silent. And, and now... Their, as a result of it, their relationship with him had grown cold, and it was but a distant memory. And, and if that was not enough, worse still, they had developed a slave mentality. Uh, they had become prisoners of the mundane and prisoners of the routine. Uh, they were having a difficult time because every day they had to make brick without straw. Come on and walk with me, Marcy. Every day, they had to heave and haul the stones that helped build the great monuments of Egypt. Every day, they had to tend to the fields of the Pharaoh. And, and, and the harsher that the labor became, the further they fell away from understanding what freedom was. Y'all ought to come on and walk with me. For them, the bright light of hope had long since gone out. For them, the vision of a future had faded and grown faint. For them, disease and disappointment and death were bitter reminders of their own condition. For them, every second every, of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, of every decade had simply become business as usual. I wish I had somebody walking with me. But then somebody would wonder, why would not God answer their prayers? After all, this was his people. But I would like to say to you, but God, God in his own time decided that he would listen, not only listen, but address the prayers and cries and pleas of his people. God moved 
And God arranged an interview with a fugitive by the name of Moses, who was a former prince of Egypt and now a herder of sheep. They met there on a mountain. And then at the mountain, they met at a bush. And the bush was on fire, but the bush was not consumed by the fire. And from the bush that was on fire and not consumed by the flame, there came the voice of God who in turn commissioned Moses to be an advocate on behalf of his people. Y'all not walk with me. And then laid down his strategy for deliverance. God had to remind them that it was he who brought them out. And, and I know that there are folk among us who got short memories. Yeah, God has brought us out a lot of things, but, but as time passes, we forget sometimes where our help comes from. But I stopped by to tell us this morning, we ought to all remember from whence cometh our help. I don't know about you, but my help yeah, comes from the Lord. But not only did God have to remind them, but God went through a process of reestablishing them. God reestablished them. Throughout biblical history, God had suffered the enslavement of his people. You, you don't have to take my word for it. Just read it. They were in and out of slavery. And he suffered it because of their disobedience. And my brothers and sisters, let me remind you, disobedience leads to consequences. But there were some times when in their enslavement didn't have anything to do with their disobedience to God. That the enslavement came as a result of nations and or individuals who had strategized to grab control and power and greed and put and captured the Israelites and put them into slavery. And, but I stopped by here to tell y'all and to remind you that the Lord, I don't know about your Lord, but the Lord I serve loves freedom. And the God I serve loves liberation. And, and when God got tired and in his own time, he decided to intervene and intercede. He sent his emissary, Moses, to secure their release, extract them from Egypt. Y'all not walk with me. And not only extract them from Egypt, but then to start them on their journey toward the promised land. That's what the Lord did. Now watch what the Lord did. Not only that. So while, 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 while Moses had begun his work, then the Israelites, the children of Israel, the Hebrew slaves, were better able to see God's hand at work. For when God intervened, there was a prolific paradigm shift in their life. When God intervened, there was a monumental movement that was taking place. Now, I know somebody said that Elijah said he saw the Lord in the midst of a still, small voice. But not, that was not the case in this time, because the Lord not only, the Lord showed up in grand fashion. He showed up mightily. He showed up magnanimously. He showed up mysteriously. His wonders to perform. Now, I, I, I know, watch what the Lord did. While they were, while the children of Israel were still going about business as usual as slaves in Egypt, the Lord was operating on a totally different, unusual realm. The Lord, while they were making brick without straw, the Lord was turning rods into serpents. The Lord was issuing bowls for the flesh of all those who were not his people. Y'all not walk with me. While they were making brick without straw, the Lord was busy allowing frogs and flies to fly all over the place. While, while they were busy uh, pulling stones, the Lord was allowing the hail to hammer the earth. Y'all not walk with me. While they were busy making brick without straw, the Lord was busy allowing lice and locusts to light all over the earth. While they were busy doing the mundane work of being a slave, the Lord was at work doing a mighty thing, killing their livestock and then turning rivers into blood. Don't you tell me what my Lord cannot do. Now, I stopped by here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, it's been a long time since the Lord had had a conversation uh, with his people. It had been a long time. They had a long 400-some year communication gap. And they kept praying, and finally they stopped praying. But I want you to know that finally the Lord not only showed up, yeah, but the Lord 
also showed out. And remind me of what that old song say. He may not come when you want him, but my God, he always is on time because he is an on time God. I wish I had some help in here. But then, my brothers and sisters, let's be fair. Fresh from the plantation, these, these former slaves were having a hard time embracing this newfound freedom. After all, it had been dramatic. It had been certain that they were snatched from the plantation. Y'all not walk with me. They, they were having a hard time wrapping Marcus, their brains around this drawer. They, they had a hard time understanding it because they had no concept of freedom. Yeah, they, they didn't have a strategic plan. They didn't have any contingency plan. They didn't have a backup plan. In fact, they were not privy to the initial plan. But I stopped by to tell you, the only plan that they had, they didn't develop on their own. They had a plan that I like to call rawhide one-on-one. -on -one. Head them up and move them out. That's the only plan that they had. But we ought not be too hard on the former slaves. Because as they went, finally trouble raised its ugly head. And their fear overruled their reason. And we ought not be mad at them because they were justified in their fear. And I'd also make an argument that they were valid in the questions that they had. You know, where are we going? And who is this guy leading us? We don't know him. We didn't have any participation in selecting him. And then he's leading us and he's following a God that we don't even know. Man, we, we, we left all in Egypt. We left with that which was familiar to us. And now you're going to bring us out here where we're going to die in an unfamiliar place? We could have stayed in Egypt and died. In other words, they were willing to return to business as usual. But I stopped by here to tell us, brothers and sisters, don't be too hard on our brothers and sisters of past time. Because right now, we're facing something similar. Yeah, we've been, uh, we've been under stay-home orders. We've been under uh, social distancing. I, lo I love these terms that we come up with. Uh, we've been doing all these things in order to try to arrest this, this terrible virus that is attacking the globe. Uh, and so now, though, we are tempted because we've been out of uh, we've been out of service for a while. We, we've been out of work for a while. We've been out of school for a while. And we're tempted to return to business as usual. And not only are we being tempted, we're also being pressured by the powers that be to ignore the lessons that were gleaned from previous plagues and pandemics. This is not the first one. But if you go back to 1918, there was a pandemic called the Spanish flu. And it killed, it infected over 500 million people around the globe. 50 million people died and over 675,000 of them were right here in the United States of America. Why would we not want to learn the lessons? Instead of rushing back, let's learn the lessons from previous things that have occurred in this country. I wish I had somebody walk with me. But no, nah, we, 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 we have it in our mind to return to our businesses and have it in our mind to return to our jobs and to our classroom and to our schoolhouses. But let me remind you, there's a panther out there that's raiding right by your doorstep that's wanting and waiting to crouch and pounce upon you called Corona because death is outside that door and we still got to walk gently and and, and, and we still got to walk in a way that's going to be protective and cautious because it is yet too early, yet too early to return back to business as usual. But I think I ought to remind us, I think I ought to remind us, as much as things have changed around here, they remain the same. Because if you look at it, the poor and the marginalized, black and brown people like most of us, are right now bearing the brunt and bearing the burden of the disparities 
the economic disparities and the health disparities of this terrible virus. Yeah, things seem like they've changed, but they haven't changed that much. I, I stopped by here to tell you that it's really as usual because greed and power are still in the forefront. I wish I had somebody walk over me. Greed and power, we watched it demonstrated over and over again in just the last couple of months. All of that stimulus money, stimulus money, some of it had been set aside to help small businesses. But don't you know, large corporations got in and grabbed up the money. Places like Ruth Chris ended up with $20 million. While small businesses like barbershops and salons and other small businesses are struggling and now the money's gone and don't even have access to get money that was promised to help them. Y'all not walking with me. And then look at, we got $1,200 in a stimulus. And I would argue it should have been more. But you got banks who have billions of profits every quarter who are still demanding that the mortgages of people who are now out of work be paid. So the $1,200 that you got, hope you don't run out and spend it, but if you go and pay it on your mortgage, what kind of sin and evil is that? When you make billions of dollars on the quarter, and then you got people out here who are not working because we have a stay-home order, and you still want them to pay their mortgage, the decent thing to do is to let them have at least a three or four minute four month pass on the mortgage and if you have to if you really have to need to put it on the end because what three or four more months going to do at least they can take the twelve hundred dollars and buy some food with it i wish i had somebody walking with me it makes a lot of sense y'all not walking with me but let me tell you something greed and power is still out there not only uh, did, did, did the stimulus the business stimulus money uh, get assault by large corporation. Not only that, but Wall Street was given right off the bat $2.3 trillion. And nobody is saying anything. I, I wish I could stop right there, but I can't stop right there. Because just this week, we had some southern governors who decided that they're going to reopen their states. Never mind that death is still out there. Never mind that corona is still raging. And, and they're strategic about it because they know that oftentimes the thing that they're going to allow to be open is what attracts people who look like you and I. I wish I had somebody walking with me. And all they're trying to do is keep up with the one, this deranged, disgusting, uh, would-be dictator who now is backpedaling and saying that he's not the one who encouraged them to do such a thing. Well, I stopped by to tell you, just, just, it's, it's, I stopped by to tell you that not only is it them, we've still got some, uh, we've got some folk even in our own ranks. And I hate to say it, but we've got, we've got some under shepherds. Y'all ought to come on and walk with me. Right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, have an under shepherd who decided to bring his folk together because he said he could defy death. And there they got a packed church. And there a shepherd is supposed to take care of the flock, not lead the flock to the edge and the ridge and have them to go over and die. We ought to come back together. And I pray for my brother and I pray for other brothers and sisters who have that kind of mindset. Let us, I know the Bible said we should not have the spirit of fear. But we ought not forget the other part of that text. For the other part of that text, because we have the, the spirit of power. We also have the spirit of love. But we also have the spirit of a sound mind. And in this day and time, we need sound minds. Do I have a witness in here? And, and I just want to share this with you. I'm going to pick up on a quote that I heard from somebody else. It said, I am not going to die to improve this country's uh, economic situation because my ancestors did that a long time ago and my debt has been paid in full. I wish I had some help in here. My brothers and sisters, as I hasten to close, I, I, I want to share this with you. The Lord not only reestablished relationship, not only did he remind them that he brought them out, but the Lord is also trying to help us understand that we got to do a new thing. And I just stopped by here to tell you, well, you got all this time on your hand. While you are social distancing and while you are staying at home, 
while you are worshiping and working and studying and fellowshipping with technology, I, I suggest that you sit aside some time, even if you have to do it by Zoom with other people. Sit aside some time and, and reflect and meditate and vision what things are going to be like going forward. Herein is an opportunity to find new ways of doing old things because newsflash is not going to be business as usual anymore. I wish I had some help in here. Maybe we can find a way to improve relationships between husbands and wives. Maybe during this time we can find uh, the impetus to help parents understand their children better. Maybe during this time we can help teachers and students. Maybe during this time we can help pastors and parishioners. I don't know. I wish I had somebody walking with me. As we are, as we are social distancing and as we are staying at home, maybe we can have a better understanding of technology and how we can use that technology to help us worship. How we can use that technology to help us in ministry and mission. How we can use that technology to help us in study. I wish I had some help in here. How we can use it to help us in our work in our play, and even in how we shop. There's a new way. There's another way. God said, behold, I do a new thing. Can't you see it? Can't you perceive it? Forget about what was before. Don't dwell on the past because I am doing a new thing. I wish I had some help in here. Let, let me take you back to the story about the message in the music. The message in the music, I developed that worship but then I called my music, minister of music, who by the way was Donald Chisholm at the time, Marcus. And, and Donald was ecstatic. He said, Reverend, let's do it. I said, fine. So he was to talk to the choir, and I was going to get with the others, the people in the Acts drama ministry, and we we're going to get with the dancers, and we were going to have a wonderful worship experience, a new way of doing Black History Month at St. Paul. I wish I had some help in here. But I told you earlier that I understood the risk, and I also understood that there would be some obstacles, and I understood that there would be some resistance. And lo and behold, my brothers and sisters, the resistance came from an area that I did not expect. It was in the choir. And so well, Donald called me and said, Rev, you need to come to choir rehearsal. So I agreed to go to choir rehearsal. And when I got to choir rehearsal, they said, Reverend, we're not really against what you're trying to do. We, we, we just don't want to sing music that we used to dance to. And, you know, in my mind, you know, I used to do a little dancing myself. You know, and I understood. I, mean, I said, but see, the problem with y'all, you know, you weren't listening to the lyrics. Y'all were busy bumping and grinding, and you weren't listening to the lyrics. But I want you to follow this. There's a song, this old hymn that says, We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He hastens and chastens his will to make known. And so the choir starts singing it. I said, well, do you know that that song was actually a bar, an Irish barmaid song? There was a barmaid and her name was Matilda. So the lesson in it is, then they got it and they started singing a song. A few people opted out, but the majority of the choir hung in there because the message, it's not, it's really not the melody and the rhythms it's, it's the lyrics that determine whether the song is considered sacred or secular. Y'all ought to come on and walk with me. So that's why I called it the message in the music. And the songs were chosen because of their messages. I had one other lady, a saint senior in our church, who came to me. She said, Reverend, I'm not against it. But I, I just don't think we ought to have it in this sanctuary. And I said, Mother, I understand. But I'm telling you what, I believe the Lord gave it to me. And I'm going to go ahead this time. But if it don't work, I promise you, we won't do it again. She said, all right, Reverend. So when it was over, my brothers and sisters, I came here to tell y'all that the message in the music, St. Paul was packed to the rafters. And we had 37 people to join church that day and had about 17 of them for baptism the Lord showed me that there are a thousand paths to lead us to the feet of Jesus. And I guarantee you now, uh, worship will never be the same. It will not be business as usual. Do I have a witness in here? Y'all come on and walk with me. I, I, I got to go. I got to let you go. You've been with me long enough, even over the airways. Let me say this. 
I know some of you are struggling. I know this, this has been very difficult for you. But I want you to know that when God wants to do a new thing, sometimes it's mysterious and sometimes we can't see it all. You can't run to the end of the book and read the last chapter and get it all. The Lord doesn't work that way. I know it's kind of frightening. But I came by here to tell you, you ought not worry. And now this should you sweat because God's got this thing. And, and I remind you the word said, we walk by faith. You might not be able to see it now. We walk by faith. You might not be able to, uh, to discern it now, we, but we walk by faith yeah, and not by sight. And, and, and let me leave you with this little nugget. I know some of you are anxious about this stay in order and being extended and all of that, but I don't want you to be overly concerned about that either because God's got something for your anxiousness. Let me help somebody in here. Uh, these stay in home orders are not the first time we've ever seen that. The, these politicians didn't come up with that. Yeah, I call your attention to the 12th chapter of Exodus. Yeah, you'll find you'll some information about a stay-in order in the 12th chapter of Exodus. I wish I had somebody walk with me. The Lord had, done, had, had performed spectacular, nine spectacular things to change the mind and heart of Pharaoh in order to let his people go. But then when the Lord in his time, in God's time, when he was ready to bring this epic battle to an end. He said, I've got one more play that I'm going to send. And, and, and in this, what I need you to do, people, is to get a lamb. And I want you to sacrifice the lamb to me. Make sure that you take the blood of the lamb. Make sure that everybody has some. And take that blood and put it on your doorposts. And take that blood and put it on your threshold. Because I'm getting ready to do a mighty thing. Because I'm going to send uh, my deaf angel. And when my deaf angel comes by, everybody that does not have the blood on the doorpost, and everybody that does not have blood on the threshold, uh, their firstborn will be taken away from them. Firstborn adult, firstborn children. And, and if they got any livestock left, they're going to die too. But in the meantime, in order for you to be protected, I'm issuing uh, from heaven a stay-home order. Y'all go on in the house and stay there and stay there all night long. Yeah, try to get some sleep if you can. I, you, you're going to hear some strange sounds. You're going to hear some strange noises. But I want you to stay inside. Stay in the house yeah, because death will be lurking on the outside. And all night long, Marcus, the, the, the deaf angel, made his way across Egypt. And everybody that did not have blood uh, on their threshold had an agonizing, woke up to an agonizing thing, that their firstborn was dead. I stopped by to tell y'all that in that time, in that instance, yeah, there was a sacrifice made. God chose the people. Come on and walk with me. Yeah, and the people were allowed to choose the lamb. Y'all not walk with me. And, and then when the people chose the lamb, the people were able to sacrifice that lamb uh, for a particular people at a particular time. But if you'll fast forward down to the time of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah, the last time the sacrifice was made unto God. The lamb was sacrificed unto God. But during this time of Jesus, the lamb was sacrificed because of control and fear and power and greed. I wish I had somebody walking with me. But then it wasn't that long that my God and your God changed that thing on Calvary's hill. Yeah, this time, God chose the lamb. This time, the lamb was sacrificed for not only a particular people, but for all people. This time, the lamb was the flesh and blood of our own God. I wish I had some help in this place. So what am I trying to say? I'm saying, walk. Walk, children, don't get weary. Don't you be overly concerned. Don't be overly anxious because God is steering this thing. God is in control. What am I trying to say to you? It matters not who sacrifices the lamb. Come on and walk with me. 46 minus 1 could sacrifice the lamb. Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, could sacrifice the lamb. Uh, Mitch McConnell could sacrifice the lamb. William Barr could sacrifice 
the lamb. Betsy DeVoe could sacrifice the lamb. Rush Limbaugh could sacrifice the lamb. Kelly Ann Conway could sacrifice the lamb. Y'all not walk with me. The United States Congress could sacrifice the lamb. The NRA could sacrifice the lamb. And if I'm going to be fair, the Obama Obama could sacrifice the lamb. And Nancy Pelosi could sacrifice the lamb. And Joe Biden could sacrifice the lamb. It matters not who sacrifices the lamb. But the most important thing is that Jesus the Christ the son of the living God is the real lamb and when the real lamb is sacrificed there's some strange and wonderful thing that happened when the real lamb was sacrificed compassion was compelled yeah and and forgiveness was flourishing and and then Kindness was kindled and, and grace was given and mercy was manifested. Y'all not walking with me and peace, uh, peace, peace was prevailing and redemption was restoring and salvation was sanctifying. My brothers and sisters, that's why we ought not worry and neither should we fret because I know that my God has it under control. And no matter what the stay order is, no matter how much death is lurking, my God's got it under control. And if you follow what the Lord would have you to follow, then you'll be able, when this is all over, when Corona has gone away, when COVID-19 doesn't bother us anymore, when we don't have any more respirators, when we don't have to have any more ventilators, then we won't have to worry because we can join together and lift our voices and say, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved me. Do I have a witness in here? Let me hear you say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Because I know, I know, and you know it was the blood that saved us. It covers us. We are covered under the blood. But we must remember, do not tempt the Lord your God. We must remember, wheat and tares grow together. We must, we must remember that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. So let us operate under sound minds, understanding that it's not going to be business as usual when we get back. Church is going to be different. Work will be different. Home will be different. But the only thing that has not changed, my God, will be the same. Let the church say amen. I want at this time, as Marcus plays appropriate hymn or song of his choice, I want you to consider a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm talking specifically to those of you who have never confessed your faith. I know and believe in my heart that sometimes there are people who are even in church who have not made a confession of faith. I may not be able to hear you, but you hear you. And most importantly, the Lord hears you. Perhaps there was something that wrecked your life a long time ago. Perhaps there was some pit that you fell in. Perhaps there was something that challenged you to your core and you felt like you were left out there all alone. No church, no friends, no family, no God. But I'm telling you, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he will never leave you nor forsake you. There may be somebody who needs a church home. Yes, Chappelle is a wonderful church family. 
And I know we're not out here in the pews, but you know, this is just a building. We're still the church. And if you choose, you can become a part of us wherever you are. Remember, this is a new day. We can share together electronically. I invite you now, right now, in the name of Jesus, to come. Call us. Leave a message if nobody answers the phone. Email us. You'll see the information on the screen. Share that information with somebody else. Somebody in your family. Just turn and hug them right now in your family. love and serenity of our Christ in your life. Know that we love you. Know that we are caring about you and concerned about you. And Chappelle is constantly praying your strength in the name of Jesus. May God bless you. May he keep you. Benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion, compassion, of the understanding of his Holy Spirit. Let it rest, rule, and abide with each of you, now, his forth, and forevermore. Would you join me even at home and say, Amen. Until the next time, we look forward to share with you, be on the prayer line tomorrow. Also, Bible study this week, and we'll meet you here again 10 o'clock on next Sunday. Amen.